day two. This will be class three of, of open water. We have four classes we work through. This is going to be the, the math section. And I usually get into this twice, at, once at the end of class two and once at the beginning of class three. But last night at 9.45, I didn't feel like it was the best time in the world to get into math. So I could see some people were kind of starting to droop on me and fall asleep. So I want to make sure that we started today. So I did uh, take the liberty of, and I've uploaded all the uh, classes from yesterday. So all three uh, sections of the class we did yesterday are now online under Teach Me to Dive um, uh, on YouTube. So you can go back and you can rewatch anything that you'd like and make her watch it again and again and again and again. We need the hours anyway, but just kidding. Um, so uh, again, my name is Benjamin Hadfield. I'll be your teacher, uh, your master instructor here today for all this. Uh, my assistant today in the classroom is going to be David. Dave's a fantastic assistant instructor out in the water. Uh, we've got Aaron and Josh. Um, Aaron's assistant instructor um, teaching snorkeling and uh, day two of pool. And then we've got uh, Josh teaching snorkeling, and then he has they have two assistants. What we're going to do for the format today is we're going to work until 8 o'clock and get through all of class three. And then we're going to change real quick, get in uh, scuba gear, and uh, we're going to go out and get wet. Wet is the, the fun part of this class, absolutely. So um, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So the... the One more. There you go. Right there. So I sent my wife a text message the other day. I said, send me nudes. And this is what she sent me back. The nudie branch. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> she sent me a nude. Nudie branch. So one of my favorite things to find on dives is they're called nudie branches. They come in all different shapes and styles. This is one I shot in Hawaii. It's kind of a fun. They're basically colorful sea slugs. Um, and they are just fun and fun and fun to find. Um, my personal favorite sea slug that I've never seen, I'm dying to see, is called a sheep's head nudibranch. Um, it looks like Sean the sheep. Um, they, are, they have little eyes. It has a little smiley face. It is the cutest thing you have ever seen in your life. And if you get a chance, look it up on Google, sheep's head nudibranch. They are absolutely just the cutest thing you've ever seen. Now, just to give you an idea, this little guy is about this big. So... Some of the coolest things that you'll find in the ocean are the little stuff. And that's one of the things that Nikki and I pride ourselves on finding is the little bitty stuff. Um, the, the neuter branches, the, the coral shrimp. Uh, coral shrimp um, are like about this big as well. So little things are really neat. And so you can get an idea. Those are grains of sand next to him. So he's just a little, little guy. Um, and you have to look for them. You have to find them. They'll be along walls, along coral. Um, other things to look for when you're out in the ocean um, and you're, you find nice smooth sand Look for trails and follow the trails because what you'll find is your spiral cone uh, shells and slugs will be under the, the sand and they'll make trails. And so if you look really closely and follow the trails, a lot of times you can very gently put your hand under the end of the trail and you'll come up. The biggest one I came up with was a spiral cone about this long and about this big around. Um, I did find a trumpet conch one time as well the same way. And if you have never seen a trumpet conch, imagine a conch shell about this big with a spiral in the end of it about this long. So um, they get about this big, um, it's called a trumpet conch. Um, it's just really cool to kind of find. And just, just be aware when you pick up a shell, 99.999% of the time, something's going to be living in it. So please return it if you decide to, to check it out. But you'll find uh, in Hawaii, we found several that were conch shells that were this big, um, that were um, kind of half buried. You come over and you kind of pull it around and you, and you look at it, it's just beautiful. And the conch hides back in there, be aware. The most poisonous thing you will pick up, uh, most likely, will be a conch. They do have a big spike that is poisonous, and it will, it's not something you want to get spiked by. So while they are slow, they do have a defense mechanism. Next slide, please. Again, if you like what you're learning and you're enjoying what's going through the process, please go to Facebook and Google and give us an honest-to-goodness review. Um, as we go through this process, uh, we live by reviews. If you think I'm great, fantastic. If you think I suck, Fantastic. Just put an honest, all I ask is a uh, honest review of what you think we did. Next slide. So pre-dive, as we get ready to dive, there's some big things to be in consideration of. <coughs> Remember, you are in control of your dive, but your dive master should be going through the process with you and helping you through this process. So some of the things to look at as you're going through the beginning of this is the objective of the dive. What are we trying to do today? What is the goal? And I know everybody says, well, I want to get wet and make bubbles. We're going to look for a little bit more uh, dialed in idea of what we're trying to do. Are we doing a reef dive? Are we doing a wreck dive? Are we doing a drift dive along the sand? 
Um, one of the most fun uh, dives Nikki and I did, we were doing 140 feet uh, doing a drift dive um, on the backside of a reef and we came across, I mean, it was all sand, but we came across the, um, the sand dollar field of live and dead sand dollars. I mean, there was millions of them because we went across and it was neat because they were anywhere from this big to this big. Um, and some of them were live. And if you've never seen a live sand dollar, they're purple. Um, and uh, that, that um, star that you see on that, uh, that's their mouth. So that's how they eat. But it's there. So they're definitely very, very cool to check out. And we came across this and uh, we tried to take some dead sand dollars with us. Unfortunately, it doesn't really work well in your pocket. But the object of the dive was to go across the backside of the reef or across the sand for us. And we were doing a training dive on that particular dive and having some fun. Um, we've done plenty of wrecks. There's a really cool wreck that we wreck group we like in Florida um, called Governor's Walk. It's five wrecks and they're along an S and uh, you can follow them across or at the third wreck, the best thing to do is do a jump. And so you literally jump the current about, what is it, about 150, 200 feet, babe, when you jump the current on that S? On the, on the uh, governor's walk. It'd be nice if you paid attention to me once in a while. When we jump the current um, on the governor's walk, what is it, about 150 feet, 150, 100 feet or so? Governor's walk, the, all the wrecks. When we, we followed the wrecks and then we had to jump across the current to get to the next wreck. Okay. Thanks for playing. <laughs> anyway, it's about 100 feet. You have to swim across it. You stay with your dive guide. But the object of the dive was to see the wrecks. It's very cool. And the cool thing in that particular dive is there's a lot of barracuda. The barracuda get about five or six feet long. And their favorite thing to do is um, you hide behind a piece of the piece of the wreck and you'll see them and they get about a 45 degree angle and they just swim. And, and you'll get from me to you to a, a, a five, six foot barracuda. And so they're, they're definitely cool to check out. But figure out what, what's the objective of today's dive. What are the conditions? Is this going to be a drift dive? Is it going to be a current? Is it going to be flat and smooth? We went on a dive one time uh, off of Florida where um, it was the second or third dive, dive of the day. And uh, we were, um, came up from 80 feet. We were the first ones to get in, and uh, so um, and everybody else had taken their time. So we got out, and we stood on the deck of the boat, looked down. You could see down and watch the divers at 80 feet. Um, it was a smooth, clear dive, warm, sunny day, and you could watch the divers as they were putzing around at 80 feet below us. So conditions that I've good, clear uh, visibility, um, not clear visibility. Uh, what does that look like? What's our plan today? Uh, typically, when you guys get on dive boats. 90% of recreational dive boats will look like this. We're going to get on at nine o'clock. We're going to be at dive site at 9.30, 9.45. Um, you're going to be in the water for 50 minutes. Um, it's going to be a 60 foot dive and you, everybody has to have their head out of the water before, before 60 minutes or they will call the Coast Guard. But the goal of the dive is a 50 minute dive. Anybody know why most dive boats do a 50 minute dive for both their dives? That's what they'll tell you, but that's not the truth. Um, timing. Most dive boats are trying to go out a second time that day. <laughs> or if you're on the second time of the day, they want to go home to their family because they do this all the time. So, um, but what is the dive plan? And, and you'll listen to the dive master on that. What is our, our goal today? Um, David will tell you we're doing our, our deco procedures portion of our, our class on Saturday. We've got two dives. How specific are the dive plans? We're going to, uh, we've got a We've, uh, it's, a, it's specific enough that they're writing it down because they have to have it with them. Um, and they've got a, two contingency plans on top of that. But your dive shed should be planned out. We're going to go when we're doing a 60-foot dive. We're going to be there for 50 minutes. We're going to come back along the shore, do our safety, da-da-da-da-da, right? We go through that process. So uh, as we go through this, what is the plan for the dive? What are our communications? What happens if you hear... What does that mean? In our, in our case, it means everybody at the surface get the hell out of the water. There's a problem. Communications, end of dive. Um, so you want to know what, what's the recall procedure? What does communications look like? Um, if the dive master comes over to you and uh, uh, tells you that he sees something like that, what is he trying to tell you, right? <laughs> Dragon eel. <laughs> Dragon eels are really cool. They're white and, and with black spots, um, and they have a narrow face. Um, drumfish, lobster, crabs, dragon eel. I, 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 you don't see sea snakes very often, but 
usually you see eels and eels are much more fun than snakes anyway because eels get i've seen six seven eight foot eels um that get this big around and it's even better when they come out their hole and they swim because they're like wow cool it's really neat but what does the communication look like what are we going to see what's what's that going to sound like if i ask you what do you think i'm asking you how much gas do you have you know uh, if i tell you that we're at this we're at halfway we're gonna go through those communication pieces but you want to know those ahead of time because if i come up to you and you're like you're like yeah you're trying to do me dude I don't know. What, is, what the hell does that mean? I'd do it back to me, you know? And so what you're going to do is you'll look at your gauge and say, oh, I've got 2,200, 2,200, or I've got 2,700, 2,700. So you, uh, what we do here is I do, I teach everybody textile, front of the hand, one through five, back of the hand, six through nine. But uh, any way that you do it, I'll probably figure it out. So I've seen people 1,000, 2,000, you know, five, I've seen them use 600 for two, with two hands, 700 for two hands. I just like with one hand, it gives you the ability. You've got something else going on with the other hand. But what does that communication look like? Buddy checklist. Now, there is all kinds of cool acronyms for buddy checklists. Here's how I do my buddy checklist. Deb, you want to stand up for a minute? I go to my buddy, and I play the very fun game, just like we learned in, in uh, LDS primary, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Head, you've got a mask. Shoulders, you've got your BC on. It's clipped, it's clipped, it's clipped. Your air is working. You've got two regulators. They're both working. Gas is on. Fantastic. But clip, clip, clip. You got a pair of fins. You got your wetsuit on. Go ahead and turn for me. Air is on. Everything looks good. Tank is nice and secure. Looks there. Da, 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 da. Fantastic. And you had ever check me. So head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Both sides. That's my way of doing a buddy check. It's pretty simple. If it's some, here's the great thing is, is everything's pretty standardized with what we do. If you feel like something doesn't look right, it's probably not. And sometimes as a new diver, you won't be able to put your finger on something don't look right, but I'm not sure what I'm missing. And it's happened to me out of the corner of my eye. I've been like, something wasn't right over there. And I'll go back and I'll have to look at it again. Right. And so if it doesn't look right or feel right, it's probably not right. Dig deeper. The minute you get that feeling, take the time to dig deeper. Uh, budget checklist equipment familiarization. So, uh, Deb, I just want you to understand that on my BC, I've got two clips, and you can't just grab them and pull. There are two clip clips on here that you have to unclip and pull to ditch my weights. Um, I'm using a standard safety second. It's right here. Uh, mine's um, in yellow, so it's nice and big. It's right here. That's how I get to it as well. So, And I'm using a standard regular. It has uh, press in here as well. In my left pocket, I've got a spare mask, and I've got a, um, a spare uh, cutting utensil and a 250-pound uh, um, lift bag. In this pocket, I've got a spare reel and a spare SMB as well as a cutting utensil um, and a spare light. Good to go. And, and we'll do the same thing. I, I want to know how her gear works as well. Because if there's an emergency, I want to know how to ditch her weights. I want to know how to inflate her BC. I want to know all those key pieces. Because if we're, we've just become Insta Buddies um, and there is a problem, I want to make sure that she's taken care of. So become familiar with your own gear as well as your dive buddies' gear as well. Uh, exit and entries. How the heck are we getting in the water? How do we want to get out of the water? Think either of those two things are important? Gravity takes care of a lot of getting in the water for you, but getting out of the water can definitely be a little bit trickier as well. So we're going to learn giant stride tonight, um, which is a nice, easy way to get in. You're literally going to put your hand, face, hand over your mask and your regulator, left hand on your weight pouch, and you're going to take one big step. You're going to look high, step high, step into the water, and gravity takes care of the rest. But how do you get out of the water? There's a bunch of different ways to do that, right? Usually, if you're diving on a boat, there's going to be a nice ladder for you to get back on. Uh, typically, the dive bash will even talk to you about that and say, hey, as you get out of the water, grab with one hand the uh, ladder, and with the other hand, take your fin off. And if you wouldn't mind, hand it to me gently and, when, um, and make sure you tell me that you're handing me the fin. Don't throw your fins at the dive master. They don't like that. Hand them the fin. When, and with the other hand, take the other one off and hand it to the dive master. If you want the pro tip on this, um, I carry a uh, d-ring with me and what i do is as soon as i get to the boat i grab on i reach down grab it i take my d-ring and i clip it and i clip it right to myself to clip the other one clip it to myself i go over the ladder and i climb myself out um so that nobody has to help me with my stuff i i'm very independent with that but uh, typically new divers you're going to be handing your stuff up the pro tip to be aware of is you're in the ocean it's going to be going up and down right so the secret is is as it's on the downside you hold on to the ladder and you start going down Keep the regulator in your mouth, always take a breath. As it goes down, reach down, get your fin, and as it comes back up, 
you can hand it up and the up. But fins off on the down, fins hand it off on the up. Just, just that easy, right? Um, it'll definitely make your life easier. But how do we get in and out? At Ryrie, when we go to Ryrie, we're going to be doing a shore entry. We're going to walk down the set of steps and we're going to get in the water. We're going to do, walk out of this water by getting up the steps. Pretty straightforward. Lost buddy. What happens if I lose my buddy? What do we do? You, you read this in your homework. What do you do? You've lost your buddies. What do you do? I thought you read the homework. So um, stopping and crying is probably not the best option, but stop, look around for 60 seconds, up and down. Now here's the thing is we're used to being on a two dimensional kind of plane. So as I'm looking for people, I can just pan across the horizon, right? In the water, you're gonna be looking at a three dimensional plane. So you have now up, down, left and right. My favorite game with new divers as we go down is to play Where's Your Buddy? And it happens every single time. They will tell you every single group, we get to play the Where's Your Buddy? And I'll, I'll look at one of the divers, I'll be like, where's your buddy? And they'll, they'll do the exact same thing every single time. Usually their buddy's four feet above them. It's, it's just all kinds of good fun for me um, because they're like, I don't know where my buddy is. And I'm like, did you look there? And they're like, oh, and they're so surprised. Their buddy's four feet above them. Then they just, they did this. And the problem is, is I mean, you, you're all going to be wearing a skirted mask. And so your peripheral vision up and down is also, we always think about a peripheral vision being like this, but your peripheral vision up and down is going to be uh, hammered as well. So look up and down, left and right. Do it for one minute. Once you finish that, <coughs> what should you do next? After you've determined, I don't know where my buddy is or my group is, what should you do? Continue your dive? Screw them. They're lost. Hopefully it was my parents and they have a big insurance policy. And hopefully I'm named as the heir. Is that the plan? What would you do? Go, go deeper? Keep hunting the lobsters? What would you do? There's nobody else around. You can't see, you don't see your buddies after a minute. What do you do? After, if you, see, you don't see them for a minute. You've looked up and down, left and right for one minute. Done your little circle. It's clear they're nowhere within 150 feet. There you go. Yeah, you head to the surface. Now, magic question for you. Do you do a safety stop? Got to be one or the other. Yes? Yeah, why? Absolutely. The first person we always save is who? Absolutely. Always save yourself first, right? So do, a, do your safety stop. Make sure that you're safe. Come to the surface. And then the next thing you should do is once you're at the surface, launch your SMB. You should have an SMB. It's a, a five to six foot long balloon that's orange, yellow, or pink. Um, or sometimes it's orange and yellow. Um, and uh, fill that up so that people will be able to see you, so the boat can see you. So if they come to the surface, they will see you. Because you are wearing what color in the ocean? Yeah. And what color does the ocean kind of look like from a distance? Dark, dark colors. Do you think you're the most easy thing to see in the water? No. So make yourself a nice, big, visible target. So lost buddy procedures. Emergency procedures. As you get on the boat, it is imperative that you ask, is there auction on this boat for an emergency? Well, sure there is. Can I see it? How many divers do you think walk on a boat and say, hey, I want to see your auction bottle? Very, very few. Sometimes. <laughs> if I know the boat, I, I don't. But uh, just about four months ago, five months ago, there was a dive accident. Uh, they were pretty far offshore. They had somebody come up with, and end up with DCS. They went to get the Pure O. It was locked in a rusted box with a rusted lock, and nobody knew where the key was at. This might be a little concerning. So know where that's at. So when we go to do our dives together in the back of my blue truck, I've got a little first aid kit. It's about three feet long by about two feet wide by about two feet tall. It has two bottles of oxygen in it, uh, pure O. So I've got enough oxygen in there for two people, for 
an hour each or one person for two hours. Um, I also have, um, under that, I also have a full AED, um, suture staple kit, glue, um, bandages, everything you might need. Um, if you get a nice cut, nice enough cut, I will be happy to staple your, any part of you to any other part of you. I'm dying to use my new staple kit. So know what that looks like. How do you commit, how do you contact emergency services? What does that look like? How do we get through that? So be aware, what are the emergency procedures? If something happens and I'm on a boat, what channel should I use? They'll, they should tell you at the beginning. Yeah, they, uh, 16, uh, 16 and uh, 67, if I remember correctly, at most places, but um, 16 is Coast Guard, 67 is uh, most local boats, but they should tell you at the beginning of this. Because if you're ch on channel 55, you may just get some other sport. Who's this? Where are the fish biting? Our, our boat is going down. That sucks. Are the fish biting there too? You know, you, make sure you know what the boat channels are. Make sure you also know what boat you are on. Nothing is more embarrassing in life than to come up and get on the wrong boat. It happens. It absolutely happens. It absolutely happens. So, what are the emergency procedures? And then finally, go, no go decision. Who's the ultimate decider of no go decision? You are, absolutely. Now, a couple of pro tips for you. You get up in the morning to go out to the boat, you're doing a nice uh, drift dive in Florida, my favorite place to do. I talk about Florida a lot because I dive in Florida a lot. But stopping by Filiberto's and getting the uh, baby leg omelet burrito that's with chorizo and extra jalapenos is probably not the best tip in the world. So if you decide to do that, you get on the boat and you're feeling a little queasy, a little bit of a little squirty, you know, and a little Montezuma's revenge, <laughs> it may not be the best idea for you to dive. Making a Thor's Warhammer underwater is gross. Don't do it. <laughs> 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 they actually have a name for it. I kid you not. So there, there is actually a name for it. Um, and the last place in the world, I promise there's the last place in the world you want to go to is either a boy's bathroom or a boat head. The, the bathroom on the boat is possibly the grossest place you will ever even consider going in your entire life. You have a brother? You do? It's probably cleaner in his room. Just kidding. <laughs> no, it's probably actually dirtier and stinkier in his room. It, they're, they're pretty gross. And the last place, if you're getting sick, is you want to go is the head on the boat. Because then you can't see anything and you get the smell. And remember, everything stays on the boat. So, what's the no-go decision? Um, other pro tips to be aware of. Seasickness is absolutely a real thing. It happens. If you are prone to that in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. or you're just not a very experienced diver, or not a very experienced boater, which none of you really probably are. Um, the secret to that is very simple. It's called Dryamine. Uh, take two the night before, before you go to bed. Take one as soon as you get up and take one before you get on the boat. You will be like Popeye the Sailor Man. You, nothing will make you sick. You'll be level 18 hurricane on the boat, standing on the front of the mast, going, let's get more. You'd be like Cap or uh, Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> I dare you, you know, you'll be good to go. Um, Good hydration. Make sure you're well hydrated before you get on the boat. Now, I'm going to tell you there's a there's a diver adage that there's two types of divers in this world. There's ones who pee in their wetsuits, and there's ones who lie about it. Absolutely. Be well hydrated. Don't be afraid. Just pro tip for you. Um, as soon as you get in the water, try and get your urination out because you don't want to do it at the end of the dive because then it stays with you. So just a pro tip. Um, do that at the beginning. But um, you know, other things you want to, don't ever want to do, pro tip for you as well, do not ever take a banana on a boat bad luck. The captain will throw you off. Um, yeah, it's very bad. It's bad bujud, um, and you will have a bad dive trip. Why? Um, it, it goes back to ancient sailing times when they used to transport bananas. Large amounts of bananas uh, uh, create a, a mild grade of radiation, and so it would make the entire sick, crew sick, um, and they would get extremely sick, and um, they, would, they would lose a small portion of their crew every single time uh, from radiation sickness. Wild. So, um, since... Ancient Mariner days, bananas have been bad buju. And so uh, any captain worse assault will unless you have a banana on the boat. So, so don't take bananas, but be well hydrated. Um, a light meal, fruits, um, before you go on a dive boat. Um, they will, every dive of the boat in the world between dives will have uh, Ritz crackers and Oreo cookies. Um, and, and a lot of times orange slices. That's on, it seems like it's every dive boat I've ever been on has Oreo cookies. Sometimes they have Chips Ahoy. Chips Ahoy's are one of my favorites, so. 
Um, but uh, orange slices are good too. But drink lots of water. Don't be afraid to drink lots of water. But make that decision. Other, um, the, other than that, the no-go decision is going to be on the captain as well. Look at the conditions. If you're going out and it's just after a hurricane and all of a sudden the uh, tides are five to six foot and he's still going out as a new diver, I might encourage you to skip that one. Absolutely. So talk about the conditions. If they're too rough, you know, Nikki and I go out on those. Um, it's a lot more fun to get on a boat um, when the uh, it's rocket up six feet. Because it, when it goes down six feet, you and then it comes back up, you're not stopping it from going up six feet. You're going with it. So it's it's kind of fun. It's like a little mini roller coaster in the ocean. So be aware. And always look out for eels. They're again, they're my favorite. Next slide. So let's talk about the elephant in the room: non-decompression limits. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. The key to remember is there's three charts of this. And if you guys would pull out your My SSI app. Go down to the lower right hand side where it says more. And once you're in the more section of the MySSI app, you're looking for tables. Lower right, it's green. And you're looking for the EAN. Combined air EAN. Now the secret to this is don't do it in metric. You can do it in French if you want to though. Imperial. And make sure you do it in Imperial. That one's metric. There you go. Yep. Tables. Combined air. US Imperial open. All right. <coughs> so as you've seen on your app, you have this table available to you. Now, as we look at this, we'll notice that there are three sections. Now, I strongly encourage everybody in this class to sign up for Nitrox. And what we'll do is we'll figure a night when we can do it. I do it via Zoom. Um, and uh, it's about two hours. And that way you can start using Nitrox as part of your diving profile. If you like safer dives, if you like... Um, uh, more energy after dives. Uh, if you like less bottom time, Nitrox is for you. It's about 100, it's 100 bucks. You can sign up to the shop. I'd be happy to take care of you guys on that class as well. Um, like I said, we do it via Zoom. It takes about two, two and a half hours. But as we look at this, we have air. EAN32 is Nitrox32. EAN36 is Nitrox36%. Just want to show you something that's kind of interesting. As we look at this, you guys are certified for 60 feet air, right? We come over, that gives you a maximum time of 50 minutes at 60 feet on air. If you were to go to EAN 36, you can spend 130 minutes at 57 feet. So 50 minutes versus 130 minutes. Which one sounds more fun? Absolutely. So that's what Nitrox will give you. But for tonight, we're going to be looking at just the air section of this. Now, as we go through this, everything's going to be down, across, and back down. And you'll notice there's a letter corresponding with each column, right? So, for example, Deb, if I were to go down to 60 feet and I stayed there for 40 minutes, what letter group would I be in now? Mm -hmm. I would be in G. That's exactly right. All right. If I went down to 40 feet and I stayed for 80 minutes, 40 feet for 80 minutes, what letter group am I in? So we're going to be in table one. So you can 40 feet for 80 minutes and then just scroll it down. So 40 feet for 80 minutes should be H, and I think I did 100 minutes the first time. So um, if I were to go down to 30 feet for 40 minutes, 30 feet, 40 minutes, what letter group would I be in? 30 feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So you're always going to, so if we did 40 minutes at 30 feet, you're going to scroll up, we're going to go to the next one, which would be 45 minutes. C group is exactly right. All right, were you able to bring it up? Okay. I do not know what the, the Wi-Fi password is. But the good news is, because you're young and you have good eyes, if you look to your right, I've got it in giant over here for you. So, this is for our individual dives first dive of the day. We use chart one for dive one. Now, once we're at this point, we can start looking at what our residual nitrogen is and what, how long we need to stay out of the water or what we need to do. As you might think, K means I have a lot of residual nitrogen left in over my system from the dive. A means I have very little residual, I'm safer. So the lower the letter number, the letter, the safer I am. Okay, the higher the letter, the longer I need to stay out of the surface to increase my safety. So how I figure this out first is I go to 60 feet, and if I did a 40 minute dive, I'd be a G group diver. Next slide, please. As a G group diver, to level up and to reduce the amount of nitrogen, here's my times, and they're between times. So for example, if I only stayed out for 10 minutes, but less than 40 minutes, I'm still a G group diver. If I'm a G group diver and I stay out for 41 minutes, but less than an hour and 15 minutes, I become an F group diver, and so on. So for example, if we come over here, if I stay out for four hours and 26 minutes, but less than seven hours and 35 minutes, I'm a B group diver. That's how I reduce my residual nitrogen amount. Next slide, please. And based upon that secondary residual nitrogen, how long I stayed out, I come to chart number three. And this is going to be, it'll, it'll get easier, I promise you. So if I come out, if I'm going back to the water, I know I'm a D group diver, and I want to do a 50 foot dive as a D group diver, I can stay for 41 total minutes. I have a penalty time that I need to take into account of 29 minutes. So I've got 29 minutes of penalty time, 41 minutes of actual dive time that I'm allowed. Just happen to have the tables over here as well. There we go. All right, so let's get in the meat and potatoes of this and make this a lot, make a lot more sense. <coughs> Everybody have this down? Everybody get my email today? Perfect. So we're just going to draw it out. It's a lot easier if we do. So this is our dive profile. Okay, so let's just go ahead and plan out a dive together. Deb, we're going on a dive together. You and I are super excited. How deep are we going to go on dive one? 60. 60 feet. Ding, ding, ding. I like it. We're going to knock it out of the ballpark. How long are we going to stay? 50 minutes. 50 minutes. That's the maximum amount of time, right? Now, this is dive one of the day. How much residual nitrogen will I have on dive one? How much leftover nitrogen can I have? Will I have my system on dive one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. It's actually a trick question. Here's the thing: is if I don't drink any alcohol the night before, how much of a hangover will I have the next day? Exactly. So I can't have residual or leftover nitrogen if I haven't been on a dive yet. So residual nitrogen on dive one is going to be zero. Okay. So if I have 50 minutes of actual time and zero minutes of residual nitrogen, what's my total time? 
What's 50 plus zero? There you go. 50 is the exact right answer. So that's dive one. We went to 60 feet for 50 minutes. No residual motion. We stayed there for 50 minutes. Now, magically, we need to figure out at 60 feet for 50 minutes, what is our letter group? 60 feet for 50 minutes makes us a what group diver? Sure. Do you want to borrow these? <laughs> That's why you have the app. So you're an H group diver, right? Okay, because because we're coming from 60 feet straight across to 50 minutes, and then we just come straight down to H. Okay, so we're on the dive boat. We've come up from a, our 60 foot dive for 50 minutes. How long are we going to hang out on the boat for? We tell stories. We want to have a sandwich? Maybe a virgin pina colada. It's my favorite. Um, we probably want to stay in the boat for a little bit longer than 10 minutes. Now, remember, anything over 10 minutes is a new dive. Anything less than 10 minutes is a repetitive dive. But if are we really going to really climb up on the boat all together, get our tank switched out, and jump out the water again? So truthfully, we're going, to, we're going to be on the boat for a little bit, right? As things get ready, we're going to another dive site. We're going to have a sandwich. Virgin pina colada is my favorite. I, I can drink the heck out of those things. Um, how long do, do you think we'll stay on the boat? An hour? Okay, so we'll just put an hour down. So if we go to chart two, and we know that we're an age group diver, and we stay out of the water for an hour, what is our new letter group? Age group diver over two, between 37 minutes and an hour and six, and then we go straight back down. We're now a what letter group diver? G, do you see it? Okay. So we've now become a G group diver. So now that we're a G group diver, we can make a determination. All right, sweetie. So we've gone down. We did a 60 foot dive on our first dive. How deep do you want to go on dive two? 800 feet is probably a little too deep. Well, you're always certified to 60. And we always do our deepest dive first. We can do 30, absolutely. So our depth of dive number two is gonna be 30 feet. Now here's how we figured this out. We are a what group diver, G group diver? We're coming over to chart three. We're on G group diver. We're going to 30 feet. Now you'll notice there's a letter, there's a number in green and there's a number in white. You guys see that? The number in white is the penalty. That's how many minutes that you've been in the water already based upon your previous dive. That's your penalty amount of minutes. So as a G group diver, your penalty, your residual nitrogen is 109 minutes. So 109 is our residual nitrogen, right? As a G group diver for 30 feet. Now, how long are we gonna dive on dive two? Your dive, how long you wanna dive? 30 minutes we can do, absolutely. So we're gonna dive for 30 minutes. Oops, sorry. 30 minutes. So what does that make our total time now? Well, it's 109 minutes plus 30 minutes. So what's our total time now? 139 minutes. Now, to figure out our letter group, we take that new, this new number is 139 minutes, and we go back over to the first chart. We say 30 feet for 139 minutes, we round up to 145, makes us an H group diver. You guys see that? So that's what the residual nitrogen does, is it gives you the calculation that you, so you can go back to chart number one and figure out what's available to you. So what do we say? Was that an H group diver? Okay, so we came out of the water as an H group diver. Now, we've done two dives. We had fun. We told fish stories. We talked about, uh, you know, our days in the military together. I was retired from the Marine Corps. You, were, were you in? 
Army? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Got you. See, the problem is I didn't have a felony first. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't a judge telling me that I had to either prison or the Army, so no. <laughs> yeah, I think they stopped that before Alps were born. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we've, we've done two dives. We've, we've told some stories. We had some fun. How long do you think we're going to stay out on dive number three? You're going to get new tanks. Save your time. How long do you want to stay out? You might want to stay out a little bit more. I mean, remember, we've just done two okay. um, five-mile uh, runs, right? Okay. Let's give it a little bit more. Let's go for two hours. Okay. Let's give us some time. We're going to get a sandwich. We're going to tell some stories. We're going to go get some fresh tanks. So we're two hours. Now, how deep are we going to go on dive number three? Can we do 40? We just did a 30-foot dive. We have to do 30 or below. We can, do, we can actually do 30. So our last dive is going to be 30 feet. Now, here's the funny thing. We're an age group diver. We stayed out for two hours. What's our new letter group? Age group diver, two hours. What is our new letter group? Echo, that is right. So we're an e-group diver. So as an e-group diver, We can figure out our residual nitrogen point. We can go say, okay, E group diver for 30 feet. E group diver, 30 feet. What's our residual nitrogen for as an E group diver for 30 feet? It, it'll be the number in white. You guys see it? 70 is exactly right. So our residual nitrogen is 70 minutes. How long can we stay down? What's the maximum amount of time as an E group diver at 30 feet? How, what's our maximum amount of time? You guys see it? It'll be chart number three. So as an e-group diver, the 30 feet, what's the maximum amount of time? It'll be the one in green. 135, exactly right. E-group diver in... Yeah, remember, as green as go, white is, is a penalty. So we can keep doing this all day long, right? So if we did a 30-minute dive, we'll, we'll, we'll get crazy. We'll do a 70-minute dive at 30 feet. So that gives us 140 minutes of total time with our, our penalty as well as our actual dive time as at 30 feet. So now what does that make our new letter group? If we're 140 minutes at 30 feet, go back to chart one. H is exactly right, hotel. Is it starting to make a little bit more sense? Is it coming a little more clear? Yeah, it just it does the same thing. Okay, let's let's go through what it one more time. All right. Brand new fresh dive day. Who wants to pick the first dive? Fifty-five feet? We can do that. How long? Okay. So our actual time is forty-five minutes. Now how much is our residual nitrogen? This is dive one, first thing in the morning. This is next day. It is zero. You can't have a hangover if you don't drink alcohol. So our actual time is 45 minutes. So if we do 55 feet for 45 minutes, what is our letter group? So remember, if we are at a, a number that's not on there, we're going to go to the next higher number. So 55 feet is going to become 60. 45 minutes is going to become 50. We are a what group driver? Hotel. Hotel. 
Does everybody concur with hotel? All right. So we're going to stay out for an hour. Let's see. Let me give you a good one here. Let's stay out for uh, an hour and 40 minutes. One hour, 40 minutes. What is our new letter group? We're a, an age group diver. One hour and 40 minutes. We are now a what group diver? I heard it F. What else? We're a chart, baby. Nope, we're on group uh, chart two. And we're an H group diver out of the water for an hour and 40 minutes. So go down to the left and down again. So an H group diver for an hour and 40 minutes should make us a on chart two. So, so we're in H right here. Yeah. Come down. Hour and 40 minutes. Oh, on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. The F. You're an F group diver. So, oh. remember, you're an H group yeah. diver. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right there. The F group diver. Mm -hmm. okay. So, you're an F group diver. Now, here's my question to you Would it be beneficial to stay out for two more minutes? Take a look at chart. Does it? Yeah. And if we're a a higher class, is that safer? Absolutely. So if we stayed out for an hour and 42 minutes, instead of an F group diver, we're now a E group diver. The moral of the story is that sometimes it's better to stay out just a little bit longer. It doesn't hurt anything. Two minutes isn't going to kill you. You're still on a dive boat in the middle of the ocean, right? This is good stuff. So E group diver. Who wants to plan our second dive? Go we'll see some eels. Maybe some skate skate rays. I like I like skate rays too. They're kind of fun to play with. Who's got the next dive for me? Dive one was fifty five feet. I'm gonna go fifty feet. Fifty feet? Okay. Ding ding ding! I'll take fifty feet. Now the nice thing is, is we can look at this already. So we've got an E group diver for fifty feet. So we can come over to chart number three. E group diver. Bring it down to fifty feet. What is the maximum amount of time we can stay? at that depth. Maximum time. And what is our penalty time? So in the white on chart number three, yeah. hmm? you got it. 38 is, a, is our penalty. How about, why don't you come with me for a second? Come on. Come on, come on over. You be my helper. So we are an E group diver. And we're gonna we're gonna dive to 50 feet. Show me how you find it. Use your finger and point point it out. What is our penalty time and what is our go time? E group diver for 50 feet. You see it? Okay, so you're an E group driver right here, 50 feet. So now your penalty is 38 minutes. Your total time that you can dive on this is 32 minutes. Green is go. White is penalty. Okay, you got it? Stay right here. I'm, I'm going to pick on you for a little bit longer. So, how long are we going to stay down? 30 minutes? What's our total time? 68. So if we're down for 68 minutes for 50 feet, what does that make our new letter group? We're gonna come over to this chart here. 68 minutes for 50 feet. 
So 50 feet, ball it across. There's not a 68, there is a 70 though, right? So that makes us a what group diver? Good job, an I group diver. So you are now an I group diver. So as an I group diver, if I stay out for three hours and 10 minutes as an I group diver, what's that might make my new letter group? Three hours and 10 minutes. Ball it with your finger, where's I? On chart two. Over your finger, put your finger out there, it's right there. And just follow it across. Three hours and 10 minutes. Go to your left. Makes you a what group diver? D, that's exactly right, good job. Nicely done. Three hours and 10 minutes. I promise that's a 10. There we go, all righty. So, last dive of the day. The last dive was 50 feet. How deep do you want to go on this dive? 45 feet, I'll do that. So, we're a D group diver going to 45 feet. We're gonna use this over here. So where's your D? Show me D. There you go, good job. Now, we're going to 45 feet, so find 45 feet for me down from D. Just go ahead and follow it with your finger. Is there a 45? There's a 50 though, isn't there? So it would be that column right there. So what's your maximum dive time? Nope, 41. Remember, green is go, white is penalty. So 41 minutes. So we have 29 minutes of residual nitrogen. And what's our maximum dive time? There you go. So if we did a 41 minute dive, and here's kind of a fun thing here. We go to 45 over here to 50 feet. What do you think 41 and 29 add up to? If I were to add those two numbers, mm -hmm. now do you notice over here, you see 70 anywhere in here? Is that a coincidence? It's not a coincidence at all. Those, these two numbers will always add up to these two numbers. Make sense? Okay. That's how dive planning works. <coughs> you can do that all day long. Now, bottom time is measured from where to where? From the surface, from the beginning of the direct descent, you're closing in on it, to the beginning of the direct ascent. So if I were to look at it in this profile, it's gonna be right here to right here. That's the beginning of my direct descent to the beginning of my direct ascent. That's my bottom time. Surface interval is any dive started more than 10 minutes after the previous dive. Okay, easy enough? All right. David, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide for me. You can go ahead and sit down. So repetitive dives, we already talked about this. Next slide. Next slide. All right, go back, go back. So here's an actual dive that my wife and I did together. We went, to, we had a maximum depth. Now that's a key word here, maximum depth of 40 feet for two hours and 18 minutes and 21 seconds. Nope, it does that itself. That's, that's what the computers are. Um, and it's telling you that I, um, this week on where I was diving, that I had uh, 13 hours, 36 minutes of bottom time uh, of dives that week, in case you're wondering that. So my wife and I dive a lot. So as we look at this, two hours and 18 minutes for 40 feet. Is that possible on the dive, on the dive tables? Could I do that dive? What do you think? Can I do that dive or is it outside of the dive tables? Show me on the dive tables. Good. Come on. Yeah, don't be shy. Come on. 40 feet. What's the maximum amount of time I can do at 40 feet? Give me five. Good job. You're going to earn a candy bar yet. I have secret candy bars for good students. 
I didn't tell me that. I do. I've got the the dive shop knows that I've got a very bad sweet tooth, so he keeps a secret stash of candy bars for me that I share sometimes. So can't do that dive is kind of the consensus of what I'm hearing. Because if we go to 40 feet, we fall it across 130 minutes. Well, that's more than 130 minutes, right? But here's the neat thing with a dive computer. Next slide, please. Here's my actual dive profile. As we look at this, my wife and I went down. We kissed 40 feet. We came back up, kissed 40 feet. We came back up, came close to 40 feet, came up, da -da, down, up, kissed 40 feet, came up, came up along the reef. I did a quick uh, navigation check and came up. My average depth on this dive was 28 minutes. Now, here's the neat thing with dive computers is as we look at this dive profile, it assumes that our dive is gonna look like this, that we're going to directly ascend, we're gonna stay at that, that bottom depth perfectly, and then we're gonna come right back up. Not once, not ever, have you, will any of you ever have a dive that looks like that? Your dive will look more like this. So the nice thing with having a good dive computer is it will take into account the times you're not actually at depth. So in this particular dive, we never came in even close to NDL, the not naked compression limit, because the dive computer took it into account all the times we weren't at 40 feet. And what it told us at the end of it is we had an average depth of 28 feet. So let's look at 28 feet, we'll look at 30 feet. And it, even if I had an average depth of 30 feet, I have 205 minutes. Now is that dive possible? Absolutely. So I did 138 minutes. I could have done a whole heck of a lot longer. And by the way, this is one of my, my wife's favorite dives of all time. Um, we, we did a, a shore dive um, off of Mile Marker 4 in uh, Kona. Went down. Uh, we found all kinds of cool little pokas to go through, some blowholes to go into, all kinds of fun stuff. We did a two tank. It was two tanks dives. For us, we took two tanks at the same time to make sure we had enough air. And we both came back with about a grand in each. So uh, we came back with 2,000 pounds of air total about. So it was really fun dive. Uh, found all kinds of cool stuff. But absolutely. So when you start thinking dives, they don't have to be short, right? You can absolutely stay in the NDL. And that's what a really good dive computer will do. And that's, I wear a dive computer on me. You guys, when I go out to open water, you guys will see I do wear a dive computer. So a dive computer will give you credit for those times that you're not down and it'll track you individually. So that's my pitch on a, a good dive computer. They do sell a bunch of different dive computers here. Um, I like most of them um, and uh, I dive with some of them. I've got uh, two of their top computers uh, personally. So um, that's kind of the cool thing. It also keeps you track of your residual nitrogen and your surface interval for you. Um, you could do your dive planning based upon, okay, I'm getting ready to go in in 20 minutes. You can do a dive plan right on your computer and say, okay, how long can I stay down at what depth? And it'll take into account your individual unique dive profile. So next slide, please. <coughs> so the safety stop. We talked a little bit about this the other day. As we get ready to ascend, you and I are done. What does that look like? You come to the end of the dive. That's it. Are you okay to go up? Yep. We're going to come together. So I got you because I promise you, if you guys get far enough away, I will make you do drills all day long. It's my favorite thing to do. I'm not that mean. I'm just kidding. But what we're going to do is we're going to dump a little air and we're going to start swimming the surface. When we get to our 20 foot mark or 15 minute mark, um, where we've determined that our safety stop, because we, we do this crazy thing called communication ahead of time. I would be willing to bet good money that your best vacations are the ones that you guys talked about ahead of time, made plans and determined how much money you were going to spend, where you're going to go, where you're going to stay versus getting there. And I thought we were staying out. You know, nothing's more frustrating than nothing's more frustrating than not making a plan ahead of time and then figuring, uh, hoping that your partner has the same expectations as you. Because with my wife and I, our expectations on scene don't usually match our pre-expectations. So if we set, we communicate. So we're gonna talk about that, 15 foot, 30 foot. We're gonna talk a little bit more depth about that as well. But once we get to that predetermined safety stop of 15 or 20 feet, we're gonna stay safety stop at three minutes. If we've had a particularly big dive, we've gone down and we've spent a long time at 60 feet or 90 feet or whatever you're certified for, you might do a five minute safety stop. And what you'll do is you're going to get in a horizontal position, you're going to stay together, and you're going to relax and look at fish. 
for three to five minutes. Each time I ask you, what's this? I'm asking how much safety time do you have left? You look at your computer and look at your clock and you can tell me two minutes, one minute or clear. This is, means I'm, I'm done with my safety stop. Now, if we're down and you're kind of bored and um, I've told you we're gonna do a five minute safety stop and you finish your safety stop and I tell you, I've still got two minutes left. You go up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like it. I like it. That was good. That's, that's the best. She flipped me off. It was awesome. I like it. <laughs> yeah, you're screwed. Stay there, buddy. Knock yourself out. No, you always stay with your buddy. Just because you're not done with, they're not done with your safety stop or you're not done with yours doesn't mean everybody's done. So stay with your buddy at all times. Next slide, please. So every tissue compartment is, has what we call an M value. And M really, literally just stands for maximum value. So think about the tissue compartments like a balloon. We blow the balloon up. There's a magic point. You ever pop a balloon by blowing it up? You ever seen a balloon pop up? Pop because it was, absolutely. That's because it hit the past the maximum value of gas it can put in that balloon, right? It had too much. Well, your tissue compartments are the same way. As you come up, they will fill with nitrogen. And there's a maximum point of each one of those. And it's called the M value. Now, the thing to remember on that is there is no hard line for anybody of where that M value is. Now, how you process nitrogen, how you process nitrogen, how I process nitrogen, and for love of God, how she processes nitrogen are going to be very, very different. I'd be willing to bet she can go down to the track and outrun both of us on the on, running around the track, right? We're going to be like, oh, 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 right? Yeah, it's because she's younger and in shape, right? Everybody processes nitrogen differently. Now, where it really get, kind of screws with your head is that we process nitrogen on different ways on different days. If I'm not hydrated, I'm not going to process nitrogen the same way. If I've drunk a bunch of Gatorade, I'm not going to process nitrogen the same way. By the way, don't drink nitrogen uh, uh, Gatorade before a dive. What it does is it fattens up the, uh, the hemoglobin cells and the white blood cells, and they don't transport oxygen nearly as well. So you will reduce your sac rate by drinking Gatorade. That is, there's a lot of stuff I'll talk about that won't be in the book, I promise you, this being one of them. So if you had a big big dinner uh, the night before, if you had a small dinner, if you're tired, you just got off the plane, there's a lot of factors that go into figuring out how much tension your cells can hold. As we all know from balloons, there's not an exact point. If I fill this up to you know, 10 PSI every time, some will pop, some won't, right? Just luck of the draw. And that's really how it comes out to a lot of times with um, the M value. So there's kind of a gray area between that. And as you start getting closer to where that M value is, you start building up what's called silent bubbles. That's when the nitrogen comes out of the solution, like the bubbles in, in soda pop. And as they get bigger, they become, they become symptomatic bubbles where they start becoming a problem. Now, how do we get rid of that? We do more deco time and spend more time at safety stop. We do slower ascents. So faster ascents and no deco time or no safety stops increases our risk. More deco, uh, slower safety stops or more safety stop, longer safety stops and slower, safe, uh, slower ascents, less risk. We become less symptomatic. It lets those bubbles come out of the solution a lot slower. Next slide. So what's the takeaway on this? Pretty sure dive tables and safety stops are how divers manage the size of the bubbles in their bloodstream. Safety stops assist in the reduction of the size of these bubbles. There's no clear line between good and bad. Every diver is different in the way their body manages the size of the bubbles and the reduction. The key to this is just do a safety stop. By the way, that's side mount. If you, in case anybody's wondering what, what side mount looks like, that's me diving the side mount tank. Next slide, please. Now we, did a study, I shouldn't say we did, but SS, SDI did a study and they took a group of divers and they took them down to 130, 20 feet and left them there for 36 minutes on nitrox. Group A did a direct ascent to the surface. What they found is that they, um, at about the 16, 17 minute mark, those, group, those divers had about 119,000 bubbles per cubic liter. A lot of freaking bubbles. Now it's interesting to note from zero when they surface, the bubbles may, had their highest gradient at about the 16 minute mark. That's pretty atypical. And as you see, over the course of time, by the end of two hours, they were still about 18 to 19,000 bubbles per cubic liter. Now, dive group number two, they did a two minute safety stop 
at 20 feet. Okay. You can still see they had their highest gradient point at about the 60 minute mark. And then gradual reduction through the course of time at two hours, they're at about a five minute uh, or, or 5,000 uh, bubbles per cubic liter. <coughs> then you have dive group number three. They did a one minute safety stop at 20 feet and a four minute safety stop at 10 feet. As they went along the course of time at about the 43 minute mark, they had zero residual nitrogen. So next slide. Takeaway on this, safety stops reduce bubbles. A longer safety stop reduces more bubbles than a, a short one. And a five minute safety stop during a repetitive dive increases the safety margin dramatically. Do a safety stop. There's my argument for a safety stop. In the end, you do you. Next slide. Now flying after diving. How long should we wait? 24 hours, give me double five on that one. There you go, you gotta get crazy. 24 hours, what that is is allowing the nitrogen to come out of your system enough that as you go into a pressurized cabin, you're not going to get the bend. That can absolutely happen. Getting on a plane after, after flying or going up in altitude, you could absolutely get the bends. Next slide. So, who's got my answer? Everybody scream it out at once. Gee. Good job. Next slide. By the way, those are all actual test questions, by the way. Now, proper shore diving procedures. How does that work? First thing is, is you want to check for the, the waves and the surf injury for where you're getting ready to go to and understand how to deal with the surf. There are really cool apps. For example, um, Mickey and I went to Hawaii uh, just a few months ago. Um, the first thing I did is a bunch of research. Where can I go shore diving? I really didn't want to. We did uh, um, three different boat dives we, for six total dives um, each. It cost us 1600 bucks uh, for uh, a total of what would two, four, six, 12 dives, 1600 bucks. It was uh, three boat trips. We decided the rest of the week we wanted to do shore dives because I can rent a tank for 10 bucks with lead. We usually go out with two tanks, so it's 20 bucks a dive. So um, each uh, for. Uh, uh, a, a single uh, for four tanks in a day. That was a total of forty bucks. So much cheaper, right? Uh, over the course of the day, we research out, figure out where we could go. But the next thing we did is I downloaded the app uh, for the waves. There's free apps on the iPhone. I'm sure they're on the Android as well, where you can figure out when will the tide be the highest and the lowest. Absolutely, absolutely. They're all over the place. So typically. You want to find out if it's this is correct, but most dive sites will want you to enter about an hour prior to high tide and exit about an hour after high tide. That is when it'll be the safest and you'll have the best entry. We're not going over rocks and crud and, and, and other things like that as well. So making sure you check the, the uh, tide report and then check the wave report. Um, we had the, the issue we were on uh, staying at Mauna Loa, um, which is kind of on the north, just north of Kona. Um, we've had some really sweet dive sites, but there was a, a tropical storm coming in and there was about a four foot area between two good heavy sets of waves that I didn't want to try to navigate back through. So we checked the tide report and the waves were seven to nine feet. That is not good diving conditions. Don't try that. It just, it just won't be a pleasant thing. So what we ended up doing is we went to the uh, south in, and found some coves where we could get in very easily and the waves weren't affected. So find that out as well. So. And then figure out how do you get in the water? You're getting ready to do a shore dive. We're all geared up. How do you get in? Absolutely. You're going to walk backwards without your fins. You can walk forwards until you're ready to put your fins on, but you want to generally walk arm in arm. And then once you get to about chest deep, you can back back in, put your fins on and keep walking backwards with your fins, arm in arm until you get to about chest height. Once you're about chest height, you could absolutely drop and start swimming. And once you get to about six to eight feet, um, the waves won't be as quite as big a deal. You can get pretty much underneath and they'll, they'll cycle out and push you out as well. So next slide. Proper procedures for boat diving, avoiding sick sickness, entries and exits while in a boat. Um, we talked about this briefly. The big monster burrito over at uh, Filiberto's is not the best start. Draw mean night before, take two the night before, one the morning of, one before you get on the boat, you'll be a superstar. They do make sea bands are about 10 bucks for a pair. Um, they just go, uh, just read the directions. They go a little bit farther back on your pulse line. They do work pretty good. 
Um, other things, as you're on the boat, if you feel yourself getting sick, stay on the, surf on the surface of the boat away from the diesel engine and make sure you watch the horizon. It's called posting. Keep an eye on the horizon at the distance and it'll allow your brain to anticipate what's going on more easily. What, one of the reasons most people get seasick is their brain is unable to anticipate what's going to happen. Right, it's like Space Mountain. You don't know if you're gonna turn, you're gonna go up. That's why most people get sick because their brain's not able to anticipate and uh, cope with the next action that's going to happen. Other key things, a little bit of ginger goes a long way and staying well hydrated. <coughs> One of my favorite things to do, we, uh, there's a dive boat that I like to dive um, in Florida. It's a, a fairly uh, flat bottom boat, so it has a fair amount of kick. We always end up with the divers from um, Milwaukee or um, Chicago. And, and every time we get on the boat, it's always the same thing. I've done 9,819 dives in a dry suit in sub 18 degree weather. Not a, that's great, dude. And they, I'm the most experienced diver on the boat and usually... Um, either just before the first dive or just after the first dive, um, you'll see them uh, going for distance and accuracy um, off the uh, the, the uh, stern of the boat. Invariably, it happens. Don't be that diver. Be aware. I mean, none of us, we live in a landlocked state and we're not on high seas all the time. We are not Popeye the sailor people, right? Don't be afraid. A little driving me and a little preparation goes a long way. I've been I've been on plenty of dive boats though. It just they were it's it'll sneak up on you sometimes, that's for sure. Next slide. Just be careful. All right. Entering the water, proper amount of weights, control descent, navigation, performing an ascent, exiting the water, and emergency plan. So we talked about how to get in the water. The best and on the test, the best way to get in the water is the easiest and safest. Simple enough. However, is the easiest and safest for you? That's the answer to the question, by the way. Now, I was, on a, I was doing a dive um, with some friends. Uh, we were out doing a tech dive together, and uh, there was me, a buddy, and uh, one other guy, and then this other guy that was um, supposedly the greatest diver on the planet, and he was going to be the next God's gift to, next, to tech diving. We were like, whatever. Cause he, and he was telling us all about how he was God's gift to tech diving. We're like, okay, whatever, you do you. And uh, so we're all in the back, on the stern of the boat, on the, on the uh, swim deck, getting ready to get in, and... Uh, Yelled to the captain, go ahead and set us up. And uh, he looks at us and he says, I can't do a giant stride. I have to do a back roll entry. Okay, you do you. So if you need to do a back roll entry and that's safer for you, do a back roll entry. It's just a Kool-Aid plunge. Um, they're an ST plunge. Uh, we'll, we will be doing that in class tonight or, tonight or, or on uh, Wednesday as well. So you do you. Whatever it takes for you to be in safely. If you have to wait for the engines to get off, sit on your behind and then two-handed in, you do that. You're going to generally find it better to do a giant stride, but you do you. Finding the proper amount of weight is another key thing. We've we both spent a, a few minutes with a pack on our back. Is it easier to pack up a hill with a crap load of extra stuff in your pack or, or streamlined a little bit less? Absolutely, right? Now, I was always fairly smart. I always took an extra uh, couple of things that I could sell in the field, but, um, you know, an extra uh, carton of cigarettes because I don't smoke was always, I could usually get 10 bucks a, a, a package in the field. Uh, for my my little idiot officer buddies, because they all of them, I I need a smoke. Well, I happen to have a pack. Can I bum one? No, but I'll sell you one for ten bucks. So I was that guy <laughs> in OCS and and uh, TBS. I was that guy, right? But I realized really quickly that when you when you're a scholarship kid from a farm community, that money's at a premium. With and the idiot kids that come out of uh, high dollar school uh, school that mommy and daddy paid for had plenty of extra money, so it wasn't a big deal. But having Less crap in your pack means you go through less air. You'll be safer. You'll be able to reascend to the surface more easily. You'll be able to be buoyant. Most accidents can be avoided by knowing how to do two things. Fill your BC and ditch your weights. That's a test question. Now, one of the things that with proper weighting, it is also going to help your controlled ascent and descent as well. So if you are overweighted and you got a crap load of weight in and you drop through water, your uh, air, what's going to happen is... You're you're going to bounce off the bottom. Now, there are plenty of things on the bottom that will poke you, sting you, uh, cut you, scrape you, and, uh, um, that, and that you can hurt as well. So making sure that as we're doing a proper descent, we let our, the gas out of our BC completely. We, in the vertical position, we hold that straight up, and we start our descent. Once we start our descent, we get into dive position, and then we have a control of our BC. And as we start coming to the bottom, you can give it a puff, 
give it another puff, and then slow yourself down until the point where you can literally stop yourself. Breathing normally, always breathe. So you can descend to the point where you can start to the float. We're gonna do that tonight, we're gonna to float. Now, one of the things that happens underwater once we're down there is all bets are off when it comes to navigation. You can't see the sun, you can't see the, the shoreline anymore. North, east, west, south, all become fairly oblivious, right? So the first thing you wanna do is when you, uh, before you go down is you wanna take a look at your compass. Which way is shore? Which way is the dive gonna go? If we're doing a dive on, in a drift, what direction are we drifting? There are times where you'll come to a drift and the current will break. I've been in those where the current will break left and the current will break right. I've been in an S current where it literally yeah, made a con con continuous set of S's. Um, so you followed it this way and you were going south a little bit. It curved, came back around, it came north. Then it went south, then it went north. So you definitely want to be aware of that and, and take your navigation ahead of time. Nikki will tell you that um, I use my navigation on my compass all the time. And the most I'm usually off, even on a three, three and a half, four hour dive, is I'm, when I'm navigating is about 30 to 40 feet. I can usually navigate myself back, but it's not rocket science. You use a compass, it's right there. Just keep, a, keep an accurate eye on it, keep an accurate eye on your time. Performing an ascent, again, you wanna make sure that we're controlled on that. We've talked about that to nth degree. Exiting the water, we're gonna talk about, uh, we're, you're gonna talk about that part of the dive. If we're at Ryrie, we're gonna just come back up the steps. If you're getting back on a boat, we talked about that. Have, grab the fin or the John line. Um, a lot of times they'll throw a, uh, they'll throw a John line out to you. You can hold onto the line, take one fin off. Now, pro tip for you, when do you take your regulator out of your mouth af after a dive? When your butt is sitting in place on the boat. Now, a lot of you probably haven't been on dive boats to this point yet, but there are no soft edges except for the captain's chair on a dive boat. Everything is hard and metal and designed to be take the worst beating ever. So the deck is wet, the boat is moving, uh, as you, and you've got a lot of heavy equipment on your back. Leave the, the regulator in your mouth because it has a nice soft bite. So if something were to happen and you were to slip, trip, fall, whatever, bump into something, you get to keep your teeth. So um, make sure that you keep that regulator in your mouth. Or what happens if you fall back in the water? Yeah, you got to find your reg. So keep your regulator in your mouth until you're sitting on your butt on the on the deck. And your emergency plan. We talked about that to nth degree as well, so we're, we're going to skip that. Calculating gas consumption. Calculating your gas consumption um, and tracking that. You guys think it might be reasonably important to, to know how much gas you go through? Now, in the book, it talks about doing your gas consumption. I disagree firmly with how it talks about at figuring out your SAC rate. Now, SAC rate stands for surface air consumption, SAC. So if I'm gonna figure out my SAC rate, where should I figure that out? It is, but where should you figure out your surface air consumption rate? Absolutely, just like in the name. Now, it's important because the thing about it is, is the size of my lungs and the basic capacity to which I go through gas is not going to change. I can calculate and I can make adjustments for it based upon depth, based upon effort, based upon a lot of other factors. But the thing about it is, is my base rate of information won't change. So as we figure out the, uh, the uh, uh, miles MPG uh, for my truck at sea level is pretty much not going to change, right? If I figure out that my truck goes is 15 miles a gallon, I can make a calculation and adjustment based upon it being at 5,000 foot elevation or pulling 5,000 pounds. You know, I can make those adjustments, but the base rate of information is not going to change. What's going to change is the exterior factors like altitude, like effort. Um, like how fast I'm pushing it. Um, other things are going to change, but the base of how the engine operates, how much fuel and air that each cylinder holds is not going to change. So that's what we want to do is we want to figure out the surface air consumption rate at the surface. SSI talks about doing it at depth at 20 feet for 20 minutes. I disagree firmly with that because if, if you don't have a good base rate of information, how can you do accurate calculations of anything? So David, if you flip to the next slide, please. Here's how I suggest doing your surface air consumption rate. After di uh, dive day one, 
I want you guys to go home and please, 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 if you would, do me the huge favor of taking a picture of yourself doing this because it, it just makes my whole day. Sit, get, set up one of your tanks with a regulator on it. Put your mask on and find your favorite TV show. My favorite is Big Bang. Um, it's about 20 minutes long. Write down to the, at the beginning of it how much gas you have in your tank. If I have 1,000 PSI, write that down, whatever it is. Hit a stopwatch. Watch your show. Breathe only from the regulator with the mask on your face. And at the end of your show of 20 minutes, write down exactly how many minutes and how what the final rate of gas is. Measure the PSI at the starting. Breathe normally for 20 minutes. Measure the volume at the end. Divide by the total minutes. Repeat three times to create an average. Next slide, please. Now, determine the sack rate for the dive is pretty simple. All you need to do is multiply your sack rate that you've come up with times your ATA. So for example, 33 feet is two ATA. So if I, if I go through 10 liters a minute, atmosphere, atmospheric pressure. So 33 feet is two ATA, 66 feet is three um, ATA. Um, so if I go through 10 liters a minute and I'm at 33 feet, how many liters per minute will I go through? Ten liters a minute times two. Twenty liters a minute. Ding, 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 ding. Exactly right. If I'm at sixty-six feet or three ATA, and I go through ten liters a minute, how many liters per minute will I go through at sixty-six feet? Yeah, thirty. It's just that easy. Thirty. Uh, I'm going to multiply it by my actual atmosphere, my my depth. So if I know thirty-three feet is two atmospheres, sixty-six feet is uh, is three atmospheres. 99 feet is going to be four atmospheres. So if I'm at 10 liter per minute and I'm at 99 feet, I know that I'm going to go through 40 liters per minute. Now, there's only one other thing to, to accomplish in this to get an accurate sack rate, and that's just multiply by the effort. Because we all know that if, I, if I'm pushing a cart through Walmart, getting my, uh, my Cocoa Puffs and, and uh, Fruit Loops, um, I'm not going to go through a lot of effort and gas for that. It's not going to make me very tired. But if I go to the track at IF and I decide to run for a half hour, I'm going to go through a lot more gas, right? A lot more effort. So simple enough, a warm, easy drift dive is going to be a multiple of one and a half. A cold, heavy effort dive where I'm kicking a lot is going to be a three. So I know that if I'm doing a nice, easy dive and I go and it, I'm at 33 feet going through 20 liters per minute, all I need to do is multiply it by 1.5 for a nice, easy dive. And now I'm 30 liters per minute. So I need to calculate 30, 30 liters per minute. You can do that by PSI as well. So if I know in an 80 cubic foot tank, I'm going through 10 PSI per minute. I know that at 33 feet, I'm going to go through 20 PSI per minute. If I'm, it's a nice EV dive, it's going to be 30 PSI per minute. But I have to have the base calculation of accuracy first of what is my lung capacity? Because I can't calculate my capacity, air capacity based upon her information because her lungs are probably a liter and a half. Mine are 2.2. Yours are probably 2.2. Yours are probably a 1.9. They're all different. But the thing about it is the only thing that's going to change my surface air consumption rate truthfully is if I get on the treadmill and I start working out and it's going to take six to eight months for that to happen. It's not going to, my surface air consumption rate is not going to change very quickly. It's going to take a lot of effort. And there are things you can do to help that as well. Um, I do use an elevation trainer to help uh, strengthen my lungs to give me a lower sac rate. <coughs> and it works pre pretty well, um, but it takes time. It, it took probably three or four months before I noticed the first change um, where I started seeing an average, my average go down. And I, so I worked at it, right? But that's basically how you do it is if you guys would, like I said, after dive day one, in your living room, take a tank, put a regulator on it, put your mask on, watch your TV show. If you really want to get slick, watch Jacques Cousteau. It'll be, you can watch him dive and you can have your mask on. You can feel like you're diving with him. You can make the motions if you want. That's how you figure out sack rate. Um, start with the surface air and then work your way down into the calculables. Easy enough? After dive day one, um, you guys will have, because uh, before you guys go down to, for your open water um, certification, um, we'll give you everything you need. We'll give you two tanks, regulators, everything you need for the dive, for the dive weekend. So after dive day one, go home that night. And uh, so after Saturday, that night, sit down and watch TV with, with one of the tanks that you've already used. And then dive day two, you can show up and you'll have your sack rate. Easy enough? And like I said, please take a picture and send it to me.
So please, 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 if you would, please take a picture of it and send it to me. That's just my favorite thing. People do. I had one of my um, uh, dad's um, sent me a picture. He, uh, his son fell asleep while doing it. He was watching wow. TV. He was dead asleep, curled up in the chair. It was um, Silas. I've got a, I have a picture somewhere of Silas curled up in the chair. He's got the regulator in his mouth. He's got the mask on. He's just dead asleep. <laughs> it was awesome. I had an, uh, another couple from a di deep dive class. They sent me. Um, they were watching. And they even got a picture with them and watching Big Bang because Big Bang is my favorite. So next slide, please. Now, avoiding panic. Panic's a pretty big deal, right? And uh, you know, I've been in the military, so we've been through a few situations that should cause panic and could cause stress, right? Usually has to do with a private. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> somebody is usually somebody that did something really stupid um things that cause panic br difficulty breathing environmental conditions the equipment comfort and ability identifying uh the panic response uh, and preventing a panic so one of the one of the first things that causes the caveman brain to kick in if you will is when we start having breathing difficulties we're in a heavy we're in a heavy drift we're in a heavy current we're having to kick really hard and we're not able to exchange the gas in our lungs for good oxygen well enough. Anxiety sets in as we start to get a little bit of hypercapnia, right? It's just one of the things that happen. Um, environmental conditions, we're in a new environment where it's dark. Um, I had a diver, I was taken out, taken out uh, to do a deep dive class we, and uh, we we're gonna do the buoy line um, out at Ryrie. We were, it was an 85 foot dive we were doing. We got down about 30 feet, he couldn't see the bottom, he couldn't see the top and he could barely see me. He went into full on panic mode because he couldn't see. It was bad environmental conditions and it was uh, uh, overwhelming his sense. It absolutely happens. Unfamiliar with the equipment, had a diver uh, that was out. Uh, he just wanted to kind of shadow us. Uh, I was teaching a class. I told him, I says, I can't watch you. You got to do you. Um, that was uh, uh, Riley's dad. Um, but he had a, a BC malfunction. He wasn't quite familiar with the BC and it wouldn't hold air at all. He got, when he kicked to the surface, he was in full panic mode. Equipment failure, it happens, right? Training, staying within your, your ability, your comfort level, and um, your, uh, your training um, and your ability is definitely a key thing. I know most guys, uh, for me, I've always pushed the, the envelope a little bit farther than I should have, um, but you should always stay with your training, your ability, and your comfort level. And it has to be all three of those. My comfort level is everything. I don't care. I just, let's, let's, we're going to do a 200 foot dive day. Let's, let's do it. I'm good. But stay within those. You're going to find. So one of the things that you're going to find is identifying the panic response. And if you're really interested in this and want to get better at it, we have a stress and rescue class. And the whole goal of stress and rescue class is to create situations in which you will start to panic. You'll start to get stressed out. Our whole goal is help you identify and feel that panic so you know what it feels like as it starts. What does that anxiety feel like? And what can you do to start preventing it? Now, it's a pretty simple process. Next slide, please. So let's start with it. What is the signs and symptoms? What does it look like when a diver gets panicked? What do you think? Why don't you look at this question for me and what do you think? What are, you, what are the signs and symptoms, signs of a panic diver? B, wide-eyed, fearful look, fast and erratic breathing patterns. As we're watching you guys in open water, one of the things that I'm looking for is I do not let tinted masks in my class. I need to be able to see your eyes. I will know a lot about what's going on in your head by looking at your eyes. The, the larger they get, the, the more I'm going to be right on top of you holding on to something. I had a situation, we were at the city pool one time, and uh, we were in a small circle, and, and we were doing regulator drills. And I was probably me to you from a diver, and, and he pulled the regulator out, put it back in, didn't clear it, and took about a, a breath of uh, um, water, where he inhaled about a teaspoon worth of pool water into his lungs. I knew exactly what had happened because I watched his eyes go and they were huge. I mean, they, they had to been two inches in size and I see it. And, and all of a sudden he turned into what I lovingly call the wet cat. It was all arms and legs trying to get to the surface. I swam to him and, and I got to him pretty quickly, had my arm on his BC. And uh, he, by that point, he was probably at six feet. So I went ahead and just pulled him the rest of the way, pulled him to the surface and let him cough it out. But you see it immediately. It's very, very clear at a diver in Ryrie that went to a full panic re um, equipment rejection. We were about 25 feet down. We were doing mass drills. And we talked about this yesterday. Mass drill one is halfway. Mass drill two is all the way. Mass drill three is off, right? We got her down. She'd been late. So I had to do her skills by herself. And 
I was right there and I had my hand where I could just grab her at any given time. She was literally right here. And I said, master drill one halfway. And she cracked it in, shook her head a few times, shook her head a few more times. And then she took the whole mask off. And I thought, oh, okay, I guess we're doing master drill three. All right. And all of a sudden, um, she shook her head again. And then she turned into what I lovingly call again, wet cat. She spit the regulator out of her mouth. And she started trying to swim to the surface without the regulator. Eyes about like this. It was not a big deal. I grabbed her, grabbed her regulator, shoved it in her mouth, pushed the purge, held it on, held on to the back of her BC, and it controlled her ascent to the surface. Got her to the surface, filled her BC, put her on her back, drug her to the side. No big deal. For, um, everybody was fine, calmed her down. Oddly enough, about 15 minutes after of calming her down, when we went down, she did the skills perfectly. But we're watching for things, signs and symptoms. You guys will feel like I'm in your bubble. I am absolutely in your bubble. I need to be able to control the situation for safety. But we'll watch that. I'll watch the eyes. I'll watch the amount of bubbles. If you're starting to go, I'll know something's wrong. I'll be on top of you. One of my dive guys will absolutely be on top of you. Next slide, please. So the process, when you start feeling this, you feel that anxiety monster starting to well up in you. So I want you guys to stop. Whatever you're doing, just stop. Breathe. Big, full breaths. Get that carbon dioxide out of there. Think. What's going on? And as part of the think process, one of the things I'd like you guys to get in the habit of doing, pull that SPG out and figure out how much gas do I have left? And I want you guys to get to one easy mathematical concept in your head right now. Gas equals time. If I have a lot of gas, I have a lot of time. If I have a little bit of gas, I have a little bit of time. But look at that gas. And that will give you an idea of how much decision-making time you have. The one time I started to feel a little bit of anxiety build up in me on a dive, we were at 108 feet um, in zero visibility, and I had the worst light on the face of the freaking planet. It was, a, I swear to God, it was one candle light, uh, kind of watt power. And I was trying to see, and I couldn't. And I could feel myself starting to get a little anxious. I was like, this is weird. So what I did is I stopped, closed my eyes, and I gave three big breaths. <sighs> Checked by gas, I had 2,900 PSI. And then I thought about it. I've got plenty of gas. Am I entangled? No, I'm not entangled. Can I make an ascent to the surface? Absolutely. Is there a big shark here in Ryrie that's going to eat me? Love of God, I hope not. Right? So what's, what's scaring me? Right? Uh, and what you'll find most times, uh, my favorite story about anxiety is I, I remember I was, uh, my, for my sixth birthday, my parents got me a gun rack a uh, uh, BB gun that looked like an M1 Grand and a, a new Kevlar helmet. And they put that in the corner of my room. It was the coolest thing. I was the proudest six-year-old you've ever seen. They had his own BB gun that looked like an M1 Grand, right? It was, it was green as everything. Well, the problem is, is as the, I was, uh, as the sun set, I went to bed. And the problem is the moon kicked in. And as I looked in the corner of the room, that, that nice Kevlar helmet looked like a man standing in the corner of my room. And I'd forgotten that I got a new Kevlar helmet. Swear to God, I stayed up from, uh, all night with the covers right here, watching the man in the corner of my room watching me back until about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning when the sun came up and I realized it was my stupid Kevlar helmet. Most problems you're going to encounter just like that. They're just shadows in the dark that aren't real. So diving is extremely safe. So think through the process. What am I really scared of? Think your way through it. And then finally, um, I've got a friend, Mike Young, who owns Kiss Rebreathers. He was talking about a cave. He did a. He was one of the last divers to do uh, the Blue Hole in uh, uh, Santa Rosa, New Mexico. They were 800 feet in a cave, um, and uh, he had a buddy that he asked to stop at 190 feet, um, and uh, didn't. And so he, uh, his buddy, got panicked and and uh, sooted everything up, broke the line, and they had to, he had to figure out his buddy ended up dying. But he ended up getting trapped several times in this cave. And he said, there was three times through that cave process that I was sure that I was a goner. And I asked him, I said, Mike, what did you do? He says, well, I stopped, I breathed, I thought about it. And I realized that I'm not going to make one more step unless it's the right step towards safety. He says, as you go read these accident reports, you realize every accident reports has this point that said, if they had done this, they would have saved themselves. If they had done that, they would have saved themselves. So as you're doing this process, think about What's the next thing I can do that will take me one step closer to safety? And think about that. It's kind of a neat way to think about it. Next slide. So my pro tips for you today are going to, on this are going to be stop, breathe, at least three big 
inhalations, exhalations. Think about it. Check your gas supply because remember, air equals decision and action time. Another thing you can do is stop and, and count backwards from five. Why do you think you want to count backwards from five? Is counting backwards from five a normal action? Do you count backwards from five a lot? No, it's an unnatural action. What it does is it helps calm you down, but it resets your mind to an, with an unnatural act. Review everything around you. What choices do you have? Relax your body and slow your breathing. It slows your air usage. And then act. If you have a malfunction, it can be cleared. Can it be cleared or fixed easily? Do you have a buddy near that it could help? Should you start to the surface? Ask yourself the key questions. Make sense? Next slide, please. Lost underwater. So one of the things that I encourage every diver that they should have is a nice SMB. If something happens, you can launch a nice SMB. And as you can see, that's a pretty hard thing to miss. I launch one every dive when I'm out in the ocean, regardless. Surface marker buoy. Um, they're between 60 and 100 bucks and Hopefully you never have to have one for an emergency situation, but they also do make a, a nice flotation device as well. But it's a nice way to mark that. If you're out in the ocean and you're doing a, a boat dive, you launch one of these, the boat will see you. They'll be more likely to find you, definitely to your advantage. Next slide. Now, there's two types of air sharing that we're gonna go through. There's the emergency air sharing ascent, and uh, there is going to be the emergency swimming ascent where we don't have a buddy. So as we got, start going through this process, we need to make those choices of what needs to happen. I'm getting a hard breath on my regulator. What's going on? And I need to start making that decision process. Am I at 20 feet that I can just start swim to the surface? Am I on my safety stop? Is my buddy close enough? And so you need to, as you start having challenges, Depending upon the, what's going on, you just need to start making that decision of what needs to happen in any situation. Next slide. So, air sharing and ascent. Um, I'm going to stop here because we're not going to do this till next week. So, if you don't mind, usually we're a little farther on the pool than this. Other than that, we're, tonight we're going to go through regulator drills one through three. We're going to go through um, regulator drills one through five. So. Regulator drill number one. We will, I will show you the rest of this later. Mast, we're gonna start with mass drills number one. Mass drill number one is going to be halfway. Good news is I'm gonna demonstrate this in the pool at the surface. I'm gonna demonstrate it in the shallow and I'm gonna demonstrate at depth. So you all will have a chance to see me do it three separate times. And then all you gotta do is monkey see, monkey do. Can you do monkey see, monkey do? You ever play Simon Says? Basically, we'll replace Simon Says without actually saying Simon. Can you do that? Right. Good job. So, mass drill number one, halfway. You're going to look up. You're going to take a breath in. You're going to crack the top of the mask and let the water in halfway. You're going to take two fingers and put them on the top of the mask. You're going to, again, look up. And you're going to breathe gently out your nose until all the water is out of the mask. Now, I ask you to do it gently because every one of the masks that we have this evening, even the ones you purchased, are boogie-free masks, and we're going to try and keep them that way. So blow, blow gently, not heavily. So that's my joke of the day. <laughs> you're just going to put two fingers on the top of the mask and hold it, and you're going to look up and just breathe out your nose. The positive pressure from you breathing out your nose will automatically force the water out of your mask. If you take one breath to get it all out, great. You're a superstar. If it takes you five breaths to get it all out, congratulations, you're a superstar. If it takes you 10 breaths to get it all out, congratulations, you're a superstar, but we might talk about it. So simple enough, just two fingers on the top of the mask to hold the mask in place. And just blow continuously out your nose and it'll push the water right out. Oh. Mass drill number two is gonna be very similar. It's gonna be mass drill number two all the way. You're going to look up, crack the mask at the top, and let all the water in that you possibly can. Again, take two fingers, you're going to put them on the top of the mask, look up, until all the water's out of the mask. Mask drill number three is going to be very similar. You're going to take the mask, you're going to go and crack it and let all the water in. Once all the water's in, you're going to take the strap from the back, put it over the back of your hand, and you're going to pull it away gently. 
I encourage you, put water in the mask before you pull it away. Because if you don't, it look like the roadrunner <laughs> with your eyes coming out, right? So once you get it out, I want you to get used to taking that left hand, reaching over and find the nose well. Make sure it's in the right direction. Now, pro tip for you, as you're putting it back in place, once you get it and it touches your head, your forehead, start exhaling immediately. What will happen is your bubbles will go up and they'll fill your mask and you'll get about three quarters of the water out of the mask. So put it, once it's over the top of your face, put the strap back over the crown of your head, look up, blow out your nose until all the water's out of your mask. Mask drill number three, all the way off. Now, regulator drill number one is going to be take the regulator, grab the regulator where the hose meets the second stage, the big round thing. Once you've got a hold of that hose, Take a deep breath in, Turn, take it out of your mouth and make sure the mouthpiece is pointed down. Take it away and make sure you blow bubbles. Make the motorboat sound, it's kind of fun. Once you've uh, done that for a second, go ahead and put it back in your mouth. And what you're going to do is push the button on the backside and purge. It'll, and then you can take a breath. The value to you is that by doing this, it takes all the water out of the regulator and you'll be able to breathe freely again. Regular drill number two is very much the same. Regular drill two will be the blow. So you're going to take that regulator, take a deep breath, pull it out of your mouth, point it back down, take it out. Every time that regulator is out of your mouth, make sure you're blowing bubbles. Put it back in your mouth. You're going to blow out verbally with your, with your lungs. It'll clear that regulator. You're going to breathe back in again. Regular drill number three is going to be the toss. The same thing. Grab it, that hose where it meets the second stage. Take a deep breath. Take it, toss it away. Breathe out and blow bubbles the whole time. You're going to straight arm, lean to your right. If you lean to the right, gravity will take over and that regulator will fall to the side. Simply straight arm, thigh, tank, up and around. Other hand from your elbow down, come up with the hose, put it back in your mouth and purl it your preferred method. Thigh, tank, around. Thigh, there you go. I see plenty of people try it from tank Thigh, don't do that. Thigh, tank, around. Regular drill number four. We'll pause for just a second. So we were just talking about regular drill number three. Regular drill number three is going to be the toss. We're going to grab the first stage, uh, the second stage, at the hose where it meets the big round thing. We're going to take a breath. We're going to point that down and we're going to give it a toss. We're going to blow bubbles. Anytime that regular is not in our mouth, we're going to blow bubbles the whole time. If you don't blow bubbles, I have to make you do it again. We're going to take that arm, straight arm, while we're blowing bubbles. We're going to thigh, tank, around, left hand over to our wrist, come down. We're going to come back up with that hose. We're going to put that regular in our mouth, clear it, and you're good to go. After each drill, just give me the okay. Regular drill number four, very similar. We take a deep breath, grab that hose at the point where it meets the second stage. You're going to Throw that away. You're going to reach down. You're going to find your safety second. It should be right about here. Grab the big round thing, yank it, pop it in your mouth, and clear it. Once it's cleared, you're good to go. you got all the time in the world. Sure. Clear it with the water in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without doing a purge. Yep. Absolutely. And just... The push the purge. Yeah, you just push the purge on the end. So you can eat, uh, if you don't have enough gas, just push the purge in. <coughs> now, once you've on the, once you've switched to your safety second, you're going to take that left hand, you're going to reach down, you're going to find the bottom of your tank, and you're going to lift it up. You're going to take that right arm straight out over top, and you're going to find the big silver thing on the back. That is your first stage. It looks like this. It has a whole crap load of hoses coming out of it. You're going to reach back and find that, find the hoses, find the primary that you're not sucking on right now. You're going to put that back in your mouth and pur purge it your preferred method. You can either, or you can push the button and purge it. Whatever ha makes you happy, makes me happy too. Once you've got that done, I would like you to take that safety second and go ahead and clean it up. My signal for you, if you haven't cleaned it up, will be do this. So take that safety second, you put it back in, there's a, a rubber keeper. Just put that rubber keeper around the mouthpiece. It'll go right there. Okay? Easy enough. So once you've got that rubber that put away, good to go. And your final drill is going to be the free flow. Regular drill number five is the free flow. What you're going to do is take a breath 
Take the regulator in your mouth. You're going to turn your head at a 45 degree angle. You're going to put the top portion of the regulator in your mouth. Just like that. You're going to push the back button and it's going to go to free flow. Breathe in three or four breaths. Just relax. It's, if you shot in your mouth, all the bubbles are going to go right in your mouth. Yep, just put half of it in your mouth and just push that purge button. That's all you got to do. Once you've got me three or four breaths, put it all in your mouth, take a deep breath, give me the okay. That's what I want to accomplish this evening. So we're going to go through snorkeling. I'm going to have one of my um, assistants uh, teach snorkeling, and we're going to jump straight into um, mass drills and regular drills. And that's what we need to end this evening with at least. If we can get to air sharing, I will, um, but I, I don't think we will. So, sound good? All right, guys, go get your swimsuits on. <laughs>